Um, I'd like to first, uh, therefore, introduce uh, Christina Kuo, who we've had the pleasure of speaking with a number of times. Uh, I'm a great fan and I've uh, followed a lot of her work, of course, uh, research work and uh, books and so on. Um, Christina is a social scientist with an interdisciplinary focus on education for climate action. She's an expert on girls' education in developing countries, 21st century skills and youth empowerment, and the intersection of gender, education, and climate change. Uh, Christina co-authored an amazing book, which I read from uh, cover to cover, uh, and co-authored with Jean Sperling and Rebecca Winthrop, what works in girls' education, evidence for the world's best investment. And of course, we totally agree that girls' education is indeed the best uh, investment you can make. She's published numerous policy papers, including the New Green Learning Agenda, Approaches to Quality Education for Climate Empowerment. Christina works as an education consultant and as research director at Unbounded Associates. She also serves on the international jury for the UNESCO Prize for Girls and Women's Education and the Judging Academy for the World's Best School Prizes. Formerly, Christina was a fellow at the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution. So thank you very much, Christina, for being with us today. I know you have a very busy schedule and uh, we really appreciate and look forward to hearing uh, your vision and uh, your perspectives on girls' education and climate change. Thank you so much, Wanda. Thank you so much for having me here today. And thank you for inviting me to speak with you all at your showcase event. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm just going to take a quick moment to share my screen. So just give me a second. Um, Roberta, may I? Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, let's see if I can try it again this time. Thank you. I think it wasn't letting me share with, with the other screen share. Okay. All right. So, um, it's my pleasure to be here with you all this evening to really talk about an issue that constitutes pretty much the sole focus of my professional life these days. <laughs> um, and that is uh, really trying to convince decision makers um, to recognize the intersection between gender education and climate change and to accelerate education for climate action and climate justice really by making the case for more gender transformative climate education. So, you know, this is, a uh, a topic that is, uh, as I mentioned, is very much the sole focus of my work these days. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I want to kind of caveat a lot of what I'm going to say today, you know, by saying that, you know, I'm not your conventional feminist climate activist. Um, quite the contrary, I did not grow up uh, a climate or an environmental activist, nor did I grow up a feminist, but these all came to me, <clears throat> excuse me, these all came to me through my professional journey. Um, and so, you know, not your typical origin story for a climate activist, but uh, I can tell you, we, you can come from all walks of life, all sorts of experiences and find that this work is uh, what, what can drive you. Um, what I, where I did start off uh, was, you know, as a, as a human being growing up on this planet, uh, very much with an acute sense of power inequalities between between people and how these created unfair advantages and disadvantages for some groups more than others. And it was that perception nurtured by the tools of ethnographic analysis, critical discourse analysis, policy analysis, that really allowed me to connect the dots between gender equality, transformational learning and climate justice. And so today I thought maybe I could describe a little bit of that unconventional and rather serendipitous journey towards climate action and how that has fueled my work today at my own company and then also my sister company, working to support NGOs, donors, governments, private sector to step, step up their game when it comes to addressing the climate crisis through education. So my talk today is going to be broken down into three parts, and the first part will be kind of a point of departure, or really kind of describing the moment in which I became fixated on the climate crisis. Um, and then the second overviews two problems that I encountered through that journey, um, both of which I learned that if we can overcome those problems could really dramatically shift our thinking about what the root cause of inaction is, and then help to steer us towards more transformative change. And then the last and third part of, of this talk today, kind of overviews of possible solution or more so a framework for action um, that I think, I, or that I hope will you know, help inspire this conversation here and then the work that you all do um, 
uh, day to day. So, okay. So, so this first point um, of a uh, point of departure is really my entree into this work. And as I said earlier, was quite serendipitous. Um, I was a fellow, um, as one Wanda mentioned, at the, at the Brookings Institution, which is a prestigious think tank in Washington, D.C., um, and I was leading the work on gender equality in education and trying to convince world leaders why we need, needed to see an increase in global investments in girls' education in low- and middle-income country contexts. Right? This is you know, the, what, what sort of uh, was behind the What Works in Girls' Education um, uh, volume. And so, you know, there I was doing this work, drawing on the evidence of how higher levels of girls' education are strongly associated with increased economic empowerment, economic growth, reductions in early enforced child marriage, reduction in early childbearing, increased agency, increased agricultural productivity, better maternal and infant health outcomes, better, you know, immunization, the list goes on and on. Um, but one summer, I think probably in 2015 or 2016, um, I was in London in a meeting with a world leader to discuss this new girls' education initiative that we were just about to spearhead. And she had asked me a completely innocuous question. And that was, what's the potential impact of climate change on girls' education? And I was like, I have no idea. Surely it would threaten all the progress we've made as a global community in gender equality in education. Um, but what was the evidence of this? And did the girls' education community need to be brought to this issue um, unless you know the progress we made over the last several decades be unraveled? So <laughs> from there, I began to explore this question and to learn from many others, including a visiting fellow that we had from Zimbabwe who was exploring these issues too. And I was really shocked at what I learned um, in that research. So I think many of us in this room today understand that while climate change may not discriminate when it comes to wrecking its havoc upon the planet, its impacts are most acutely felt by the most vulnerable and least skilled members of society. And in many low and middle income country contexts, many of which also happen to be some of the most climate vulnerable countries, um, when we talk about the most vulnerable and the least skilled members of society, this often means we're talking about girls and women. And you all know this very well in terms of the evidence and your practice, you know, you, you know this in, in the experiences of the girls that you work with, that because of strict and constraining gender norms, girls and women are often less exposed to life-saving information, resources, and skills because they're often excluded from participating in household and community decision-making. They're also excluded from risk reduction activities. And then as the evidence showed, um, as I was, you know, trying to understand what the evidence was, women have a lower life expectancy in the face of natural disasters. And in some cases, um, research has shown that women and girls can make up as, as much as 90% of those who perish in weather-related disasters. And then those who survive are highly vulnerable to human trafficking and sexual assault during post-disaster recovery in crowded shelters or in temporary camps. And then when we look at the evidence around both prolonged and short-term weather-related crises, we can also see how household coping mechanisms put girls at higher risk of school withdrawal in order to help complete household responsibilities like fetching water in times of drought, or can force them into early child marriage because their dowries can help ease the burden of stretching scarce household resources across multiple family members. So we understand this um, in, in multiple ways. And, and in many ways, you know, girls' education work has been responding to the climate crisis, but we just haven't really talked about it as doing as being so, right? We, we know that economic shock on household resources um, due to, you know, whether that's long-term shocks or, or, or uh, uh, long-term stressors or, or short-term shocks, we understand that the, these have immense impact on girls. Um, but what we're what we're seeing at, in the research is that, or at least in the in the emerging research around girls' education and climate change, is that these kinds of responses, and we know this again through our practice, is these responses threaten to change the course of girls' futures, and they perpetuate their marginalization and thus their vulnerabilities and their climate vulnerabilities in ways that will have long-lasting impact. So we understand this. We we know the statistics around how many girls are out of school due to poverty and harmful gender practices. We know how many girls have been affected by COVID school closures and how badly we are trying to still recover from that, that period of time. And all on top of that, you know, we, we also see projections that show how continued climate disruption will exacerbate those numbers even further, right? 
So I think there's, you know, we don't need to overemphasize how much we understand that, um, you know, girls access to education and girls well-being and their um, development is is oftentimes collateral damage in the face of climate change. But while the damaging effects of climate change, we understand that they, these tend to hit girls and women in low and middle income country contexts particularly hard. I knew from my research that we were doing around what worked, you know, why why we should be <laughs> investing in girls' education. I knew from my research that surely well-educated girls and women, and especially gender transformative education systems, could be a powerful part of the solution, right? So indeed, there is not just one reason, but three reasons that we in our advocacy can really push forward. And the first reason is that quality, transformative, and empowering education for girls and boys and that education, including comprehensive sexuality and reproductive health education, strengthens girls' sense of agency, their self-efficacy, their bodily autonomy, as well as their sexual and reproductive health and rights. And when we look at this at a global level, the data suggests that there is a strong positive association between the average amount of schooling that girls receive in their countries and their country scores and indices that measure vulnerability to climate-related disasters. So we, we know this from from data, we know how important education is, and and much of this this um, this um, sort of our understanding of how that evidence works is is around how the increased years of schooling for girls helps to, to deter early and forced child marriage. It delays the first age of childbirth. It increases space between birthing births. It decreases infant and child mortality, and a whole host of things, right? And so, in the context of climate change, achieving this bare minimum level of progress and outcomes for girls and people who can become pregnant means that increased levels of empowerment and agency and higher levels of resilience are you know, critical uh, in the face of climate shocks. Um, so critical reason number one, right? The second reason why girls' education is a powerful climate strategy is that quality education plays a critical role in fostering girls' leadership and women's capacity to participate in climate decision-making. So we already know the importance of formal education and mentorship in the trajectories of women, whether that's in corporate or political leadership positions. But now we also know that there's a clear linkage between women's leadership and pro-environmental outcomes. So just as, as an example, we have research that shows us that countries with greater representation of women in parliament and greater political empowerment of women in general are more likely to ratify environmental treaties. They're more likely to have bolder and stricter climate policies. And they're also even more likely to have lower carbon footprints. Um, at a more, <clears throat> excuse me, at a more local level, when we look at girls and women and their education levels and, and their inclusion decision making at all levels, we also see that their families and communities are better able to plan for and cope with and rebound from climate crises. So, reason number two is all around girls' leadership and decision making. Finally, the third reason is that quality education plays a critical role in ensuring um, girls develop a breadth of green skills, not only to adapt to and to navigate a climate impacted world, but also to adapt to and navigate a changing world of work. And that changing world of work being one that is intended to be greener, right? We talk about the green economy all the time, and at least in the spaces that I'm in. Um, so this, this particular reason is, is crucial given the marginalization of women to the fringes of our present fossil fuel dependent economic systems. So if we want to see that, you know, and we already know that green sector industries are supposed to become the driving economic force, um, we, we, we know that centering girls and women in that transition is going to be vital to their inclusion in that alternative, regenerative, and more inclusive economic system. So surely with these three reasons and all the sustainable development goals that these touch upon, then every country in the world would be focusing on girls' education, right? I guess I was, I'm always a little bit naive because uh, my next line of inquiry led to rather disappointing findings. Um, and that was in, in particular, looking at uh, countries' climate policies and trying to understand, you know, who all's, who all, who all's got their radar open to this. Um, but the sad news was that uh, is that countries are not leveraging girls' education as a climate solution, and they're also not leveraging climate education as a climate solution. So I, in my most recent analysis, which was, I think, um, in, for COP27, um, uh, I was looking at the most recent um, updated and revised and new nationally determined contributions, um, which are countries' national uh, climate strategies for mitigation and adaptation. 
And I found that less than a third of these NDCs, these nationally determined contributions, actually mention climate change. And for those of you who, um, you, who have seen sort of the last, at least at COP28, there's a lot more momentum around this. So that's a little bit more of a positive thing. Um, and we probably won't have a good sense of how countries are doing um, in their uh, commitments to this for another three or three to four years until we see the next round of NDCs coming in. Um, but at the time, uh, we saw that only nine um, out of 140 were talking about girls in the context of their education. And only three of these were doing so in the context of climate change education. Um, and then even sadder, um, none were formally recognizing the contributions that an investment in girls' education could make towards their climate strategy. And I guess the sad, even if you want to get even deeper than that, um, this also includes the 30, so the, the none, right, <laughs> includes the 30 countries in the world where girls' education is um, threatened the most by climate change. So, um, even though we know how uh, girls and women bear a disproportionate burden of the climate crisis, and we know these powerful reasons why an investment in girls' education should be part of and central to our climate strategies, um, our current uh, policies and solutions are, are not working to remedy, remedy this, this gap. Um, so then what's the problem? What's behind this massive inaction at the global policy level? So the second part here, and I'll frame this in two, two parts, is that um, I think is really, really the, the root of this goes down to how we're framing our problems. Um, and in this case, it starts with how we're framing the climate crisis. And this matters because how we frame the climate crisis defines our climate solutions. So we understand that climate change is on the one hand a very technical challenge, right? It's due to human activity over the last century and our Earth's atmosphere now contains way more greenhouse gases than it can naturally absorb. And then as a result, we have this current, current crisis. Um, but with this problem focused on greenhouse gases and especially carbon dioxide, the solutions that follow then are really focused on decreasing the amount of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere, um, which is incredibly important. I'm not saying that's not important. This is absolutely vital um, to the, our future. But um, what happens then if we're only focusing on greenhouse gases is that our educational solutions or our social adaptations that we, that we then think of are those that will help us transition from high carbon economies to low or carbon neutral economies, that green economy uh, concept, right? And then the implication for education is that we need a workforce with those specific capacities that will help to support such a transition. You know, we have these green jobs, we need green jobs with, with people who have green skills and let's, you know, make our education systems directly targeted at helping to fill that gap. But the challenge is that Climate change is not just a technical challenge, it's also a sociological challenge. It's an adaptive challenge, which means that we don't just need technical skills for carbon capture technology or for wind turbine technicians, but we also need new ways of being, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing in the world. And so on the one hand, we can frame this adaptive challenge as rooted in unsustainable behaviors at the individual level. So including our consumption patterns, our energy usage, our lifestyle choices, and so on. And then when we think about those, we think about the role of education as shifting our individual capacities towards those that generate more sustainable behaviors and innovations and ideas. And so this can be, you know, improving, using, you know, using education to improve individuals' awareness of climate change and their knowledge of climate solutions, whether that's, you know, driving electric cars or recycling or participating in vertical farming or anything like that. Um, but the adaptive challenge of climate change isn't just a problem of unsustainable behavior, it's also one of unsustainable human systems. And so to this effect, if we conceptualize the climate crisis as a symptom of unjust social and economic symptoms, systems, excuse me, including those that, you know, including policies that perpetuate environmental racism or economies that incentivize extractive and polluting industries in historically marginalized and underserved populations, then we see that, that the role of education expands to developing the transformative capacities of individuals and society to be able to catalyze broader systems change for both social and climate justice. And so each of these conceptualizations is valid and each of these is critical to pursue simultaneously, right? The climate crisis is a technical challenge. It's also an adaptive challenge. It's both individual and it's systemic. 
And just as in our climate space, there's no single solution to climate change, this also means that in our education space, there's no single approach to education for climate action. And I think that's really critical for us to recognize as education actors. The second one, and this gets to that, you know, there's the, the, how do we how do we approach the education side of this? Is that when we're talking about the problem of education in the context of climate change, um, we're we're not necessarily talking about education in where we're, we are overly talking about it in the technical sense and not in the adaptive uh, in the adaptive challenge that it is. Because when we're talking about you know how do we address education gaps? How do we um, you know tackle the learning crisis? If we begin to uh, sort of examine how we're talking about education and learning, um, I think it's critical for us to understand that we are the most educated society in humans in human his history, right? We're the most educated in our human history, yet we are also the most destructive to ourselves and to the planet. And so we talk about, you know, what what what's keeping us from acting in, in transformative ways. I think part of it is that when we're talking about transforming education and addressing the learning crisis, oftentimes we're not looking at the root cause of, of this learning crisis and how we might need to interrogate our framing of education um, in order to reshape the solutions that follow. So just to give you a quick quick, quick uh, kind of uh, logical walkthrough of this, I like to use Stephen Sterling's framework, um, slightly adapted for, for our context here, but really thinking about how do we frame the problems of education. And so oftentimes when we think about, you know, what, how, what can we do as an education sector, we, we tend to focus on this first row here, right? It's, it's focusing our efforts on doing things better or in, in, in the context of climate crisis, doing things greener. Right. Whether that's recycling at schools, building rain gardens, composting, adding climate change education to the curriculum, et cetera. When we, when we do these kinds of actions, we risk, or I should say, if we do these kinds of actions only, we risk engaging in conformative change that at the end of the day functions to help maintain much of the status quo and much of the, of the same, same systems and structures that have led to our present conditions. And mainly those are socioeconomic inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality, poverty, time poverty, and, and so on. Um, and so with this, we again, we risk the perpetuation of the status quo because this kind of change, this kind of you know trying to do things greener um, is, is really about achieving greater efficiency and effectiveness in our existing systems within the context of sustainability and climate action without asking whether that system is the right one. At the same time, I think, especially with us working in girls' education, we can't limit our discussions to doing better things, or in other words, engaging in reformative change that merely grants equal access and opportunities to previously disenfranchised populations into that existing system, whether that's girls, children with disabilities, or indigenous populations, or refugee children, or, or so on. An, an example of this, again, is it's like thinking of, you know, how can we just make sure that our you know, low-income communities or our rural communities or our tribal communities or environmental justice communities get equal access to the opportunities that, um, you know, uh, mainstream education systems are providing in this context, again, greening, uh, greening, greening education. Of course, such change in action is critical for equity reasons, but these efforts can miss, again, addressing those underlying root causes of any inequity. So instead, um, what what the at least from the research and from what my my own work that I'm trying to advocate in in, in all sort of, sort of manners of audiences is is really to encourage the urgency and scale of the climate crisis in our and the increasingly shorter window of time that we have to take action, and see how we can do things differently. And so in this context context, it's confronting long time problems of education and committing to the difficult and transformative change that can significantly alter not only the system itself, but its underlying purpose and its values. And so how, how we can you know, see things differently, how we might see that education as, this means that seeing how education as we know it, which is itself the legacy of the Industrial Revolution, is um, part of the problem of perpetuating social norms and social structures that are harmful to both people and planet. And then from this sort of framing, the solution then is to disrupt the status quo and to reorient the purpose of our education systems towards climate action, which requires a simultaneous achievement of gender and racial equality, intergenerational equality, and climate justice. 
And so finally, I think I'm running over my time. I'm sorry, Roberto. I'm going to like really try to go through this real quick um, is, is the solution. So if, if those are the ways of framing the problem of climate change and education, um, how can we drive more action in the education sector towards more transformative, more gender transformative climate um, education? And I think we, um, we, I would love to take a chat, you know, sort of a, a chapter from the book from gender equality and education, right? This is this is this is the work that I think our our sector has done quite well, and that is to hold us to a, a much more accountability when it comes to, you know, are we really working towards gender transformative educational experiences, or are we sort of just in the gender sensitive, gender responsive education space? You know, how can we really push our efforts to address the underlying causes of gender-based inequalities in our systems and working to transform those harmful gender roles and norms and power relations? When it comes to address uh, uh, combining that and integrating that into our approaches with climate education, we can, we can um, uh, similarly apply this framework of, of action where we begin to harmonize our terminology around the ultimate goal of achieving climate justice and addressing those underlying systems of, of gender inequality. So I'm going to stop there. I think there's there's still hopefully time for breakout conversation and questions and, and things like that. But I wanted to just sort of walk us through that my you know my own journey to where I am today in terms of you know looking at the evidence and trying to understand you know what is the connection and seeing a very clear reason why we should be addressing this, understanding that our policy systems and our decision making is not reflecting that evidence why, try to understand the problems a little bit more, and then offer this framework as a way for us to potentially help to push that the decision making into, into more transformative climate action.